One April evening, three years ago, I told my admin council that it was just about the end of appointment season and I hadn't received a call, so we should begin in earnest to plan for the summer and fall. And then, as I entered my home that night, the phone rang and I was sent to you. Pastors don't choose where they, are, where they serve. They are appointed to a congregation by the bishop and her cabinet after much prayer and discernment. So like Paul, who wanted to go to Asia but was detoured by a holy messenger to Macedonia, United Methodist pastors go where they are sent, and my detour, thankfully, brought me to you. When I arrived here, Maeve Simpson was the congregation's baby. And Noah, oh, good old Noah, he came forward, even though he was too mature, to hear the children's time, or else there wouldn't have been anybody for me to speak to. In fact, that fall, fall of 2016, we joked that we should go out and hire some kids, so rent some kids, to come to worship for us, so that when other families came, they would see children growing and learning with us. But we had a Sunday school teachers, but not very many students. And so we prayed. We prayed for children. We prayed for youth. We prayed for adults. We just prayed that people would want to be disciples with us. Before the end of that year, we baptized Angelina Colosico and then Carmen Tartania. <coughs> Over the next year, we baptized Athena Wasson, who is big sister to Everett, who we baptized this morning, and then Foster Barr, and then eight other children, including Caroline Wallander. That first year, 11 adults decided to be disciples with us. One of them, Kate Clerman, I met in the parking lot of a townhouse complex. She was moving out, and I, having been detoured here by the God and the bishop, was looking for a new place to live. And so I asked her about the quality of the townhomes and the friendliness of the neighbors. And when I discovered that she was moving to a single family home here in Davisonville, I invited her to come to worship with us. She not only came and worshiped with us, she opened her heart to us and is now the director of our education program. And another person who agreed to be a disciple with us that first year was Pat Brodsky. She had already visited here before I was even called here and she found a welcoming congregation. Pat now heads up our Cards for Troop ministry. Many people help her make Christmas cards for the men and the women deployed overseas to send back to their families. We ship the military Christmas cards so that they have something lovely and beautiful to send home to their loved ones. Last year, the team created more than 5,000 Christmas cards. But Pat wasn't looking for a team of card makers. She was looking for a congregation where she could be a good disciple. And then the Holy Spirit called her into card ministry. Like Lydia, she opened her heart, she opened her home to a new ministry. And the card makers now supply us with birthday cards and get well cards and special event cards. The Holy Spirit has worked powerfully in and through our congregation. Now, we're human. We like to think that we create a welcoming place to grow and that our ministries are changing the world. But in truth, it is God's spirit working with and through us that is powering that growth and powering those ministries. Like Paul and his team, we plan, but... The best results come when we listen to God's Holy Spirit and we're open for some kind of detour. Paul had embarked on his second mission trip, and now his plan was 
was to go and revisit all the churches that he had previously planted to strengthen and to support them, to check up on their how they were doing. And he also needed to share the decision of the Jerusalem Council that non-Jews could be welcomed as followers of Christ without becoming Jews first. So they would still follow the laws that would help them love God and love their neighbors. They would still follow the laws that make them moral and upright people, but they could let go of the rules and rituals that weren't helpful, like circumcision. So Paul's entourage left Antioch, and they went to Derby, and then Lystra, and then Frisia, and Galatia. Their news was well received, and those congregations grew even more. Now they had planned to travel through the province of Asia, but the Holy Spirit blocked them. So they adjusted their plans, and they went further northwest, and they tried to enter Bithynia. And again, they were blocked by the Holy Spirit. To me, it's a mystery when God says no to people who are just trying to do what Jesus told us to, to carry the good news to the ends of the earth. And when we're blocked, it's really frustrating. Thomas Accountus, a highly popular writer of devotion books, says, man <coughs> proposes and God disposes. Paul's journey was a marvelous mixture of human ingenuity and strategizing and divine intervention. Paul and his team just kept adjusting their plans until they found themselves right at the water's edge in Troas. And then that night, Paul spoke, God spoke to Paul through a dream. He dreamt of a man from Macedonia pleading for him to come and help. God's message was clear, a person, a place, and a purpose. And so when Paul woke up, he set in motion the plans to carry the life-giving stories of Jesus to Europe. <laughs> the Bible geek in me noticed right there, right at that point, that the author of Acts suddenly begins to include himself. The story switched from they planned and they were blocked to we immediately prepared to cross, and we set sail. So think about that. Luke was there. He traveled to Europe with them, to Macedonia and to Philippi. <coughs> Philippi was a Roman colony, a strategic center secured by retired Roman soldiers. It was a crossroads town through which soldiers, both active and retired, traveled to all other points in Europe, actually all other points in the empire. So it was a great launching pad for the message. But there weren't even 10 Jewish families that could work together to build a synagogue. And that's why Paul and his crew went to the riverbank to look for potential prayer services. Paul was called to Macedonia by a man, but the person that God led him to was a woman. What a surprise. Lydia wasn't Jewish. She, didn't, she came from Thyatira, the region of Asia from which he'd been previously blocked. She was a businesswoman, in fact, a wealthy businesswoman. I'm pretty sure that Paul did not wake up that morning and go, Great, first thing on my list, go out and find a non-Jewish woman. I'm not even allowed to speak to her, but I'm going to go out and find a woman who's a businesswoman and make her understand the stories of Jesus. But he was open to following the Spirit. She was open to hearing the good news. So when Paul preached and Lydia listened intently with her open heart, she believed. And immediately she and her whole household were baptized. And then in a surge of hospitality, she opened her home to Paul and all who were with him. If we read on, we would discover that she became a significant supporter of Paul and the followers of Jesus. She laid the foundation for the church at Philippi. 
The story from Acts offers us a historical, theological, and personal insight. Historically, it shows how Christianity left the, left the Mediterranean and began to spread into Europe. Theologically, it shows us how God's Holy Spirit directs the progress of mission and changes people's heart. It reminds us that we don't come to faith on our own. Paul and his team shared a message, and it brought new life to wandering hearts. And God's Spirit was already at work in Lydia. Before Paul's team arrived, she and others were gathered on the riverbank to pray. And so we, we can see from this that the Spirit prompts and it prods and it opens and it convicts when we work together. Personally, it also shows us the puzzling way that God works by opening and closing doors. I'm sure at the time, especially when we've been detoured, that we are not sure where God is leading us, but it's better than where we had planned to go. And while we tend to measure success in health or wealth, maybe we should be looking for success as mission opportunities. Whose heart needs to be changed? Who's in pain? Who needs to be comforted? How can you serve right where you're planted, even if it's in school or a business environment, a community organization, or a hospital or a rehab center? Even as our physical abilities become weaker and we can't do as much as we used to, God has a purpose and a way for us to share our message of faith, hope, and love. The stories of Jesus' life and death and resurrection are impressive. It's Jesus walking with us. He spoke a language that we could understand. He healed, he helped, he saved us. It would be so easy for us to make Jesus into a superhero just to be admired. But Luke continued the story in Acts to show us that the story of Jesus doesn't end with Jesus. It continues in the lives of those who believed in him. It continues. God acts in them. God lives in them. And so God's spirit is in us also. Our congregation has been here in Davisonville for 175 years. More than 50 preachers have followed a holy detour to serve here. Many great lay leaders have opened their hearts and their homes so that the people of this community can come to know, love, and serve God in unity. Because it's our 175th year, we have created many opportunities to remember, rejoice, and reach out. Our hope was to reach 175 new people, 175 Lydia's. 175 Corneliuses from last week's story, 175 Silas's and Timothy's that are traveling with Paul. We want to reach them with God's love. And so far, we've documented 29 new people. Next weekend, we're going to come together. We're going to honor the graduates and give out scholarships. We're going to eat. We're going to have a great time. It would be a wonderful service to bring a friend and let God work through you. Walk them through our open doors, and maybe God will walk into their hearts. Amen.